Well, well, false, let know. me get my energy right for the guests because I was so excited Ooh. to be talking to him. So let me go ahead and introduce him. Listen, mm -hmm. he was elected mayor of Orland Park in 2017 uh -huh. and he was reelected in 2021. He's now running for U.S. Congress. Please welcome to the show, Mayor Keith Pika. Keith. Hey. Hi, ladies. How you doing? Oh, we're doing wonderful. Right. I hope you're doing well. Please, I want to start the show off by saying, please forgive us for our rant. But when we see things on television that um, is a narrative, that when you see people playing identity politics, I really get upset about that. And I really want America to really wake up. But uh, th first, thank you so much for being on our show. You're welcome. Heard, and you're right. We need to focus on issues. That's right. We mm -hmm. need to focus on the issues. That's mm -hmm. right. Okay. So... I heard that you was running for Congress. First of all, what made you decide that you wanted to run for Congress? So it, that's a, a bit of a complicated answer, but I'm not happy with how our district has been represented. The districts have been combined with, so two districts were combined and they are currently served by um, Marie, Marie Newman and Sean Caston, who are both very far left, Nancy Pelosi, radical left politicians, and they've been pushing her agenda. So we need to defeat them to take back the house. The way the district lays out, it's very winnable. And um, as when I looked at the district, I, I've never had any inkling to run even for mayor up until five years ago. And I looked at the district and I said, there's an opportunity to win here. And I think I'm the best candidate to do so. So I, step, so I stepped in um, to do that. We've been doing a great job here in Orland Park the last five years. And I wanted to, and we've been putting people over politics and that's exactly what I wanna do when I go to Washington, DC. Wow, I heard right. that. Now, now I heard Orland Park got the lowest crime rate than any city in Illinois. Can you tell me what are you doing that Lightfoot isn't doing? Mm -hmm. well, there's 1,300 cities, including some small ones, so we probably don't have the lowest crime rate there, but we have the lowest violent crime rate of any town over 50,000. Okay. And we have the lowest crime that we've had in 27 years, even though we're in Cook County where Kim Fox is operating the criminal justice system as a revolving door. And the things that we're doing, um, we're being proactive. So some of the proactive things that we do, we really push hard to try and identify when people are, are, are breaking the law. And it could be just driving, you know, driving while, while doing drugs, while they're driving, smoking pot, something like that. And we pull them over and it, uh, amazingly, we, we often find, uh, you know, we often find illegal weapons in, in the cars when we do that. Additionally, we have license plate readers. So if anybody comes in with a stolen car, we get that. Uh, we pick that up. We have 12 million square feet of retail in town, including a big mall. And we worked with the mall to put a youth supervision policy in place during the kind of the air, times when we see, we saw crime go up in the mall, you know, shoplifting and things like that. And that policy went in last March. And since March, we haven't, we've only had one shoplifting incident during those hours. It, so for almost 10 months, and that includes Christmas. So we've done a great job with that. And then the, the one that I think is most interesting that we do that most, I, I've never heard of any other town doing it, to have a business license or a liquor license in town, part of the ordinance states, you must cooperate with the police. So if you call the police and we get there and you're a big national chain and say, well, we don't charge these criminals, we don't sign complaints, then we, then we charge you and we fine you. And so we, we only have to do that once and give them a nice hefty fine and then they cooperate. And then criminals stop coming because they will not be able to uh, steal and not get caught. And the last thing we do is we spend extra money, um, more money than most departments on investigations. So we make sure that if a crime is committed, you're going to get caught. And even though they might get out right away, none of them want to be in the system. So mm. those are the things that we do. And it's had the, the results have been have speak, speak for themselves, really. Let me ask you this question. What do you think that Chicago or, or uh, Illinois is lacking for there to be so much crime especially going on there, Chicago. especially in Chicago? What is, is it jobs? What, what is lacking there for all of the crime to, to be happening there? Well, first and foremost, not holding criminals accountable. So we, you know, so essentially they've been operating it as a, a catch and release system. The, uh, mm -hmm. No, no bail, no cash bail. And in fact, in January of 2023, they're bringing that across the whole state of Illinois where cash bail won't even be allowed. And so I believe ankle monitoring is up 1700 percent 
under Kim Fox's tenure. So if you let violent criminals out all the time, you know they're you know they're violent criminals, and you let them out, of course they're going to commit more crime. That's not a shock to any normal human being that that's going to continue to happen. And a good example for us is we actually go to the federal government sometimes to help us with this because because they won't charge. And here's a here's a really good example. I received an email from a federal prosecutor thanking. Um, thanking our department for the work they did to get a criminal um, convicted. And this criminal pled guilty to two of the three charges with a minimum sentence of six years, okay? Mm -hmm. That criminal, we first tried to get charged with Cook County and they refused to charge them. The federal government charged them and they got a plea deal for six years. And Cook County wasn't even going to provide put charges against this individual. So that it, it, that's the problem. The problem is you're not holding people accountable. And so as criminals go back out on the streets and they continue to bring more criminals, they, they bring in gangs, they get kids involved in the gangs, they just continue to destroy communities. And that's bleeding over into the suburbs and bleeding over you know, into other parts of Illinois. So what type of crimes do they hold people accountable for or do they charge people with? What, what type of crimes do you have to commit in order to go to jail? Uh, well, so here's a, today I was just at a meeting 100 murderers, people charged with murder. So they haven't been convicted yet, but they're charged with murder. Now they're charged in Cook County that doesn't like to charge people. So that means the evidence is probably pretty good. They're charged with murder and they're out on ankle monitoring. And they don't, and they're not considered to have skipped their home confinement until they've been missing for 48 hours. Oh. Like 48 hours, they could go across country in 48 hours. So that's... Wow. That's the uh, that's the problem. We're just it we're sounds like the issue. Problem. It sounds like the issue may be policy. It mm -hmm. may be the people that's uh, putting forth these policies, policies and allowing you know allowing that to happen. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um, I know that you are four term limits. Um, <clears throat> um, and I heard that you cut when you became mayor. You cut your own salary. Because, you know, and, and I want you to explain to everybody, why are you for term limits? So I'm for term limits because I, I don't think, given how things are gerrymandered and everything, I don't think we have uh, generally have a lot of competitive elections. Not A lot of districts are not competitive. And mm -hmm. if we had competitive elections all the time, the term limits would kind of take care of themselves because there's no way people could stay in for 20 or 30 years. Right. But because they're not competitive, they stay forever. And I believe that people have good ideas and we need more people to run. We have a town of 60,000. Our term limits that we instituted, so we did not have term limits. We put a, a binding referendum on the ballot. It passed 88.5% to 11.5% from the people. And it limits to three terms, so 12 years. So, and I think that's a really good number because four years, way too short, eight years, it might take you four years to kind of get control of things and move mm -hmm. things in the right direction. That gives you another four to keep things moving. Then it gives you another four to kind of teach some people to maybe take those roles, right? Mm -hmm. So 12 years works, I think it works pretty well. And if we can't find someone else to become mayor every 12 years out of a town of 60,000, I mean, that's what, six, maybe seven mayors in a lifetime? I think we should be able to find that. And I think that's true across the country. And I really think it would bring more people, it would bring more people into the fold and more ideas into the fold and get rid of these career politicians that just keep lining their own pockets. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, Mayor, yeah. so let's yeah. talk about election integ integrity. You know, we saw what happened in 2020. The left don't want us to say anything about what we saw. This is what we saw as Americans. As Americans, we feel some kind of way when our votes were replaced with other votes. When you have a massive influx of, of ballots, uh, uh, drop boxes, ballots being coming in, uh, uh, the election is not called that night is called days after the election. Mm -hmm. We just feel some kind of way. You know, I, I, it, it, when you when you get elected as congressman, what would you do about election integrity? Well, first and foremost, it's a state issue, right? Each state should have their own election. It shouldn't be a federal issue, number one. And we should look at the states that do it well, and other states should model that. That's kind of how the Constitution is laid out so that we learn from other states. So we should do that. Clearly, election integrity is very important. And what you, and, you know, we hear, you know, about conspiracies, we hear about uh, you know, ba ballots being being taken, and we know that it's happened in the past, right? But here's what I think we all agree. I think we all agree on this. We should have one person, one vote. 
that mm-hmm. that it should be citizens that vote. Legal citizens. Right. Legal citizens should uh-huh. should vote and that we want everyone to have access to voting that is legally able to vote. I think mm-hmm. those principles are really simple and we all agree upon them. Now, let's talk about how do we ensure that that happens and what happened in the last election the big, because we do talk about those things, right? And we legislate those things. And there are different perspectives. There's the perspective of, hey, I want everyone to have access, so I'm not willing to control how they vote, right? That's one way, per, one perspective on the other side. The other perspective on the other side is, okay, we need to identify, you need to have a fingerprint, you need to have someone identify, you know, someone else there to identify. That's going too far on the other side, right? So we sit there and we talk in legislate in the legislative bodies and we come up with laws to try and make sure that we're comfortable that it's one person, one vote, and people have access, and we come to agreement on that. And that's, and we can say some states are better than others, okay, fine. But what happened with COVID is we used emergency powers for one person, a governor, throughout the country to dictate new rules that took all those checks and balances that we had out of place. And when that happens, Mm -hmm. even even if there is nothing that goes wrong, because you, you, because you can't prove it, but if people feel like they're not that the election's not um, that it's rigged or they feel like it's not um, uh, you know one person one vote, then this is what causes these problems. So it's very important that we have transparent laws that are agreed upon, and these are the rules, and this is how we follow them, and we follow them. And that's not that is not what happened in the last election, as we know. There were all these emergency rules put in place, and. You know what? If you want to put those emergency rules in place, go meet with your legislature and let them come together and pass a law. They could have done that and they chose not to do that for a reason. And that's wrong. Right. So, Mayor, so there was constitutional laws broken. If somebody come and say, hey, put this rule in place, but the legislator didn't vote for it to become a law, then that means constitutional laws were broken. Were broken. Uh, quite possibly, and it depends on how each state and their emergency powers are. I think, you know, in in Illinois, I think some of those things were were circumvented. Do I do I necessarily know if it affected the outcome of any individual election in Illinois? I, I mean, I don't know, and I could never prove it because well, the other thing that's very important to all of us, right, is that we're that our our votes are um, our votes, and no one knows how we voted. So that's one of the problems with this is that once that ballot is cast and once it's counted, we no longer have a custody. We don't know who voted, right? So you can't go back and undo anything that was counted because we no longer know whose that vote was because we're trying to protect their privacy. So it's very, it's very challenging. That's why we have all of those other rules that have been agreed upon legislatively. And so if, if those things should, are changed, they should be changed via the legislative bodies throughout in every state should do their do what they think is best for their state because clearly what it, you know Montana is not the same as New York that has New York City right or Rhode right. Island is much more dense right so it's much more spread out so they're going to have to have some different rules in place let them come up with what their rules are got it got it got it okay let's move along to our babies our children you know we have this teachers union and it seemed like to me I'm just on the outside looking in, that they can do whatever they want to. And if they choose that, hey, we want to do, we don't want to go back inside the classrooms. And I know that they've reached some type of deal Mm -hmm. where they're going to be going back into the classrooms. How is it that this teachers union has such such a strong hold on the public school systems like this? Uh, It's unacceptable what happened in Chicago, which is what you're talking about. My wife is a teacher. And she's been teaching, uh, other than the first two months when everything, nobody knew what was happening, the last two school years, she's been in the classroom every day, other than the days that she may have been sick or whatever, but she's been in the classroom every day teaching. And some children chose to not come to school and, and get and, and learn online, so they were, they were online, but she was in school teaching every day. So that can, and that's in a public school system, that can be done. What, what I was really proud of here, and this, I don't know if you saw this, but I certainly did. So Mount Greenwood Elementary School, which is actually in the Congressional District 6, it's part of Chicago and it's in that district, um, 96% of the teachers showed up to work. And so the, because of that, the principal said on Monday, we're going to start resume classes. So they resumed classes when the rest of the Chicago public school system did not. So those are teachers in my district 
demonstrating and doing what they should do, which is taking care of our children and putting our children first. And I really, really applaud them because, yes, you're right, the 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 uh, the CTU should not be doing that. But they also don't rep they don't stand for every teacher. There's a lot of teachers that okay. want to be in those classrooms and teaching. And that was demonstrated in that elementary school. And it's el and it's demonstrated in a lot of the suburban school districts. Those teachers are there teaching every day. So I applaud those teachers that do that. And wow. uh, as far as protecting our children, so our village has never enforced any of these mandates. And we actually have a preschool program that we do. And we kept our preschools open. We kept our ball fields open. We were the only place in 2020. I think we were the only place, certainly in the Chicagoland area, where kids could play youth sports and youth sport tournaments. They could use our fields. We held our concerts. We did them a little differently, but we did them. We continue to do that. And we were the only town that was doing that because it's important for our kids to have as normal lives as possible. And we right. have made them bear the brunt of this disease for a disease that doesn't impact them. I've never in my life seen adults make kids bear the brunt of something that is not that we should as adults, we should be ashamed of ourselves yeah. for doing that. Yeah. That's just that's even down to making Americans bear the blunt of everything that and it came from China. Right. right. You know, with, 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 with what they're doing. Go uh, ahead. Mayor. Uh, OK, so you mentioned mandates. So the vaccine mandates, the mass mandates, the six, this, the six feet, this is all of the stuff that they're putting in place. What are your thoughts about that? Because I am not an anti-vaxxer. I am anti-mandate. I don't believe anything should be pushed on the will of the people, especially if we know that there could be adverse reactions. And anything with an adverse reaction, if it's too many of them, you shouldn't force that on. That should be a choice, a personal choice right. that that person make for themselves. So what are your thoughts about that? So I'm 100% with you that we should not have mandates and that it's a personal choice. And I am not anti-vax or anti-mask or any of that. I am anti-mandate. Here's the other thing that I believe. I believe that those kinds of mandates, because we've certainly had some of those in the past, they should be legislated if you're going to do that. And none of them have been. And one of the things that I take great pride in in our town is that every so one, we have not we have voted to not enforce any of the mandates from the state or the county that have come in. And the latest one was a week ago. They instituted a vaccine passport mandate. So we have not enforced any of those mandates. We've allowed our businesses to stay open. That's what we've done. But what the way we've done it is we have brought in and sometimes in a special emergency meeting, we have brought in our legislative body, which is our board of trustees, and we have debated it and voted on not enforcing those mandates. To my knowledge, we're the only legislative body in the whole country that has actually met and voted on these issues as opposed to one person or an administrator making these decisions. That's the way these decisions should be made because then you can hold those elected officials accountable at the next election. That's the way our representative form of government is supposed to work. And I personally believe and my board believes that these mandates are counterproductive. I believe that our job in government is to get you the best information we have and allow you to make your own decision. I have a town of 60,000 people. I do not know better than those individuals and their doctors of what's best for them. They right. know better than I do. And I, and I believe it's our job to give them the information and let them make the best decisions possible. Right. Um, my email just came in and somebody wanted me to ask you, do you feel or do you think that there was any fraud in the 2020 election? Um, I, I, to be honest, I think every election that we have that um, somewhere there's there's fraudulent action. Right. I mean, we just have too big of a country. It always happens. And that's why we have to have the safeguards in place so that they don't swing an election and impact an election. So I think it always does happen. And we need to have those safeguards in place. And each t each state, each county, they need to they need to put the safeguards in place that work best for them. And some states do it better than others. And I think if you go back in history and, and things that we've, you know, we've dug up, you know, back to certainly the Kennedy election, we know that there have been these issues that have come up and they always and they come up every every time. And there's a place to litigate them also. So, mm -hmm. you know, we litigate those things and, and and we move forward and hopefully we come up with better systems to make elections. Again, I think we all agree we want one vote, one person. Right. Right. And we yeah. want 
only people who are legally authorized to vote to vote. And we want everyone to have access to vote, too. Everyone should have access to, to an ability to get to the polls. Even people who can't get there physically should have a way that they can vote. And I think we all agree on that. Just how exactly do we do that? I think those are those are questions for a legislative body to discuss, debate, and come up with what's best for them. Yeah. And Mayor, when you said everyone should have access, every legal person, meaning if you correct. are correct, legal, we, we all want only we, right. Everyone that is legally able to vote should have access to vote. I think we all agree on that, and I right, think we right. all agree that we only want people voting one time, right? That's right. And we, and we only want people voting who are legally authorized to vote. Those that's are right. that's that's what we all want. And mm -hmm. we need to work. And there's no there, there will never be a perfect system. But let's make the system as good as we possibly can, because human human beings, there'll always be human beings that do things wrong and, and intentionally do things wrong. I mean, I don't think we'll ever be in, a, you know, 350 million people. We will never be in a in a country that we don't have some of that somewhere. But we need to have those checks and balances so that that doesn't impact the election. Mm. OK, so so here's my deal with 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 everything, um, you know, when it comes down to especially to the election, um, getting in the game back, you know, since 2015 and understanding how everything is set up. You know, I hear when you say election integrity and making up different laws and different rules that can protect us all. And I see different people across the state doing just that. And, they, and they're saying that this is going to be for election integrity. Mm -hmm. But we already have laws and rules that's on the book when it comes down to the state legislators making the rules. And even though you had, like you said, that one governor or whomever that changed the rules for for everybody and, and, and set that in stone and they illegally did that uh, because they didn't go through the state legislators to, in order to do that. My question is, who holds those individuals right. accountable? Because even though we, we you, you know, I hear you sit here and you, and, you, and you may not think that there was like literally fraud, uh, but if laws and rules were broken and nobody is held accountable, then making up all of these different rules and laws right now is not going to matter. Because they can break because them. They can, yeah, they can break it further down the line if no one is going to hold them accountable or hold the lawbreakers accountable. Our judicial system has to hold people accountable. There's no question about it. We're a nation of laws and we need to follow those laws and we need to do yeah. exactly that. And the other thing is, is that for those people that were allowed for, for two things for the for the people who made these decisions to put these things in place unilaterally um, which i think is wrong even if there's something that gives them the power to do it i think it's wrong um, and that's something we don't do here it should any emergency power should be used minimally as minimally as possible until your legislator legislature should get back together but also the legislators who let them do that the voters need to hold them accountable. Ultimately, it comes yep. back to all of us. We wow. have to hold them accountable because if we don't hold them accountable, it's going to continue to happen. And this is why I'm running for Congressional District 6, because if good people don't step up to hold these people accountable, then we, we won't have good candidates to choose from. So that wow. so people so we need to vote. We also need to get people at all levels to get out. Mm -hmm and run for office. And one of the most important offices, if not the most important office, are your school boards. Because mm -hmm. I'm, a, you know, I'm a mayor of a great town. If our schools turn crappy, I won't be able to get people to move here or businesses to come here. So we need good schools. And so school boards are extremely, extremely important so it, because you need to know what's being taught to your kids and you need to keep your schools uh, doing well. And, you know, we don't have enough people stepping up to run for those offices. So that's what we need to do. We as citizens need to step up and run for office and we need to vote the people into office that will make sure that the laws are followed. All right. Let me ask you this here. What do you think about this here critical race theory that some some schools are trying to teach? What do you think about that? Uh, I, I, I think that's I think that's wrong. I think that we have an American history and we should be teaching American history and we should be teaching reading, writing and arithmetic. 
And those are the things that we should be focusing on. We're losing our edge in internationally because we're focusing on all of these other social issues and we're not focusing on the basics. My wife's a, a seventh grade yeah. math or sixth grade math teacher now. And she, you know, so she deals with all of these issues and we need our, we need our children to be, mm -hmm. to be taught the basics and they need to be taught history. American history, European history, they don't need some revised version of what happened in history. And that's the good and the bad. We've got plenty of bad that we've done with our country, but you know what? We're the best country ever yeah. in, in history of the planet. We're the best country ever because we know what? When we make mistakes, we fix them and, yeah. and we change how we do things. We've done, and at the same time, looking back in history, trying to judge historical figures of 1700s by today's morality yeah. is impossible right. because the world has changed. You can't even judge your own parents on today's morality because I, you know 35 year you know 35 years before you came around you and I came around they <laughs> they lived in a different world than what we yeah. lived in. So, you know, you, you just can't do that. You have to put yourself in the perspective that they were living in at the time. And see, when you when I hear you say that I think about the term limits that you're talking about. When I look at Nancy Pelosi, who's been in government position for all of these years, I think about what, 17 terms, I believe, all of these different terms. Okay, well, let's think about when she first got in. And now let's think about now. You know, it feels like they feel like they had the opportunity to live the American dream. Obtain to, it. To obtain it, make all of these millions of dollars off of a, off of a, a, a representative salary, but then now that it looked like they have one foot on a banana peel and the other one in the grave, now they want to tell us dictate to everybody else like you can't have this. We're just gonna change your whole entire setting to where you can begin, become enslaved to the government. Now that's how I feel, and that's what it's looking like to me. And then when you talk about the history and schools. I believe that that's the plan. They want our children dumb. They want our children unlearned. Mm -hmm. And when I see and they them, want them to feel like victims victim. and feel like they're being victimized. Right. And that's why you will only teach a theory and not teach and the, not truth. the truth. Right. And that's, that's how we see it. So, okay, we're on the uh, same page. Let me ask you this here. Do you, are you okay with school choice? I'm absolutely okay with school choice. Um, I think, you know, here where we're at, we have good schools, but certainly... You know, and we also have good parochial schools and people do have some level of choice. But I think that clearly the the public school system in particularly in big cities has failed our youth and we have to come up yeah. with different options. Uh, in, in my consulting business, I have in the past worked for some charter schools and they do some amazing things and we can learn from them and giving parents choice, just like just like biz, just like you have a choice of where to go shop or go to have, eat at a restaurant. If you have a choice of where to send your kids to school, you're going to send your kids to school where the where the schooling is the best and right. and mm -hmm. fits with what you want them to learn. And guess what? The the people will figure that out and we'll have better schools with competition. And uh, I, I truly believe that. All right. OK, one more thing, Mayor. I just want you to know that the American people are so upset. They are so upset when it comes to the mandates, when they saw what happened in 2020, um, when it feels like that tyranny is being pushed on the American people. And when you become a congressman, you know, would you would you go up there and and would you hold these people accountable? You know, we feel like there's been crimes against humanity when you take and you deny people therapeutic medicines that can save their lives when it comes to this virus right. that still has a 99 percent recovery rate in therapeutic medicines treated. Yet you have the Biden and his regime rationing um, that type of medication and just pushing the vaccines when you have flip flop falsely flipping back and forth and the public don't know what to believe. Mm -hmm. Who's going to hold these people accountable? And when you are elected, will you hold these people accountable for raining down tyranny on the American people? So we should absolutely hold people accountable for their decisions through this. And we also need to learn from it because what we've allowed to do is we've allowed to, uh, unelected bureaucrats essentially to make decisions without accountability. And we need to hold them yeah. accountable. 
that and you know I, and I and I understand that sometimes you don't have the information and you make the best decisions possible right. with what information you have but I also know because I've experienced it here in Illinois there's information that they have that they're not sharing there's also information that they that basic information that if I didn't get in my job or you didn't get in your job we'd lose our jobs Basic right. information right. that we're not asking some very basic questions that would give us very good information to make better decisions. And, uh, you know, we definitely have to ensure that that doesn't happen. Because here's the the scariest part for, for me of all this with regards to the CDC is that people have lost faith in it. Yeah. And what happens, what happens when there's a, a it, God forbid, there's a virus that, that, kills 15 or 20 percent of who gets it you know that mm -hmm. really can wipe out a, a huge portion of our population and right. when the cdc comes out no one's going to believe them because they because they haven't been honest with me i would rather yeah. as as both a congressman as a citizen i would rather the cdc comes out and says we don't know this is the best information we have, and this is what we think based on the best information that we have. That's a lot better than dictating to me, this is the way you have to do it no matter what, when they, they themselves don't really know. So I'd rather they give, wow. they, they be completely and open and honest. I think American people can handle, I don't know. Right. And this is the best information we have. And to change your position on things um, you know, from week to week, to cover yourself yes. politically is just wrong. I mean, we always hear follow the science and science does evolve. We do get more data. There's no question right. about that. I'm, I have an engineering degree. I, I get that. But you're not following, at this time, you're trying to use the science to cover yourself politically as opposed to yeah. just giving us all the facts. Just please, just give us all the facts, give us the information and let us make the best decision. That goes back to your mandate question. Once you do right. that, I think people can make the best decisions for themselves. I mean, there's some things that are fairly obvious about, I think, at this point, about COVID. If you're over 70, this disease is very, very dangerous for you. Okay. If you're under 20, not so much, right? Those are some, if you have a lot of com comorbidities, this disease is very dangerous for you, right? So those are things that are obvious and we know. So let's work with those parameters as opposed to trying to have a one size fits all strategy oh. that certainly doesn't, it, it's not the same for a five year old versus an 80 year old. It's just not. Well, mm -hmm. you, you know, Mayor, why are they trying to, to weaponize this and politicize um, this here, especially when it comes to our children, because now they are pushing and advocating for them to be vaccinated. Why do you think they're trying to do it? I'm, I'm like, is there a target now yeah. on our children's backs? What is that about? That, I think that's the easiest question you've asked all night. The reason that they've done this is because fear worked. They scared mm -hmm. people and they got them to comply with fear. And so they realized that if you scare people enough, they'll do what you want to do. I, I said this in April of 2020, the scariest part of that first month was how fast people were willing to do whatever they were told because mm -hmm. they were afraid. And I mean, I had... I had senior citizens calling me demanding that I arrest kids for playing basketball in the park because of COVID. I'm like, they're playing basketball in the park. And we never closed our parks. The rest of the state did, but we never closed it. I'm like, are they hanging out at your house? No. So let them play basketball. Isn't that what we want our kids doing is going out and having fun and engaging with one another? But literally we had people calling and demanding they were arrested for playing basketball. Wow. That's and you think about how fast people turned on one another, right? You're seeing that even today, where certain people, you know, target people because they have a difference of opinion on this. You know, again, let's get everyone the information and let them make the best decisions possible. Okay, I promise you, this is my last question. What do you think about the Biden administration? <laughs> I think the Biden administration has been an absolute disaster. It's been a disaster economically. You know, inflation. I mean, we're printing money, spending money giving mm -hmm. money away, paying people not to work. All of these things are inflationary. When you tell people not to work and you, you, you don't have a labor supply, when you print more money, all of these things make it hard, harder for us to buy groceries, harder for us to buy gas. But then you look, um, you look internationally, leaving our, you know, I'm a veteran, leaving, you know, our people in Afghanistan is appalling. Oh. 
right? Just issue after issue after issue. Um, it's you know it seems to be what the people voted for, and it's uh, and they're you know frankly but, pay, we're all paying that we're all paying the price paying uh, for, for this and and you know also you know, they're pushing the the criminal justice reform they're pushing all these social reforms on and on and on it goes there I mean that that's what they're trying to do that is not what the, I don't believe that the policies that they espouse are what the average American wants to see. Yeah, I think the majority right. of Americans do not support these these very radical left positions. And that's one of the reasons I'm running for Congress again is because I want to ensure that we take over the, the House and um, and hopefully we also take the Senate and we can hold this administrative administration accountable and make it harder for them to get these types of things passed. Wow. I, okay, I have a quick question and, and this is be my last question because I know you got to go. Okay, so we understand that the the that Biden has been in government position for over 48 years, all right? And with yeah. everything that you just described that's just basically uh uh with everything seem to be uh being destroyed, I feel. Do you think it's intentional? I don't know that they're, to be blunt, I don't know if they're smart enough to do it intentionally. Um, I don't know that they're, I don't know that they're smart enough to have these big conspiracies. I think what happens is you put bureaucrats in control and with no accountability in control of something for so long. And mm -hmm. sometimes people just do stupid things or they have stupid ideas and there's no checks and balances to make sure it doesn't happen. And the other thing is government gets so big, you can't get your arms around it. Here in mm -hmm. here in Orland Park, the the town is small. It's sixty thousand people. It's still small enough you can get your arms around it. And believe me, there's some stupid things when I walked in here that we're doing this, we're doing that, and because it's people that have worked in government their whole life, they don't see a different way of doing it. And so I think a lot of the a lot of what we that some people say, oh, it's conspiratorial, is really just incompetence that has been allowed to yeah. run amok for so long and no one's ever no one's ever put the checks and balance because I really don't believe that most of these people are smart enough to pull off a conspiracy like this. I really don't. But see, that comes back to that term limit, like yeah. what you just said. They need to be in to and then be and up get on there. out. Okay, yeah. Mary, okay, please tell everybody how they can contribute, how they can donate to your campaign. Where can they find you at on these social media platforms? Just throw it out there. So you can find me on Facebook. You can also find me on Twitter, but uh, you, the website, and you can link to it easily from the website, which is www.keithpekau.com. -E so it's really I'll simple. Just first and last name .com, and, uh, that's and, and clearly to run for Congress, you need money, you need donations. And anyone who's living in the district, we also need volunteers. We need people to knock on doors and people to help. I love it. Grassroots work, y'all. Yes. Mayor Keith Paca, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ladies. You have a good night.